This is Shadowland, a new podcast experience from this Jungian life that explores the lives of people who take refuge in the hidden places of our culture. Lisa, Deb, and Joseph collaborate with songwriter Wells Hanley, creator of I Wrote This Song For You podcast, to bring insight, compassion, and understanding to the obscured side of human experience. Today, uh, we have a guest, and we are going to launch into one of our occasional uh, programs called Shadowlands. Shadowlands um, is a subset of what we ordinarily do, in which we bring to greater light uh, someone who you may know, we all know, they're out there in the world, who has a shadow that is particularly difficult, challenging, painful, that we don't always know about or know enough about. And today we are very happy to have with us Jean Campbell, uh, who is a high fashion model and has been for about 10 years. Uh, She has modeled for various very well-known brands such as Louis Vuitton, Burberry, and Chanel. Uh, Jean has also launched uh, her own podcast uh, named I'm Fine. And her podcast comes from her own life experience, her shadow. uh, And it's dedicated to supporting people uh, through various kinds of personal pain, their own growth, and raising consciousness uh, in, for and in the public. So with all that said, welcome, Jean. Hi. And, and thank you for coming on and being willing to share your shadow of chronic pain. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very grateful to be here. So um, help us just understand the context and the history of this experience for you. So I suppose where I am now in my life, I'm 27. I still have chronic pain, but it's manageable today. Mm -hmm. And it took me a very, very long time to get there for it to be something that was something I could cope with. But not only that, it's, it's served me in more ways than, than I would have ever guessed Mm -hmm. because it's actually become, it's become a really big teacher for me in the things that I have to do to manage it. But then also those things becoming tools that come back to me in many ways in my day-to-day life beyond just managing my pain. And so my journey, I hate the word journey, but sometimes it applies. Yeah. So in the most tangible sense, I had an accident when I was 12, um, where I was in a skiing crash and a kind of much bigger man skied into me. I was very small when I was 12 and I flew about 10 meters through the air and I ripped my subscapularis muscles, tendons and ligaments off my my shoulder with a chunk of my uh, growth plate. And it took a long time to diagnose. And fortunately I was able to get surgery to kind of correct that. And in the process of that accident, I had knocked the right side of my body. So I already had a pre-existing genetic condition called hip dysplasia. Um, But in the accident, it kind of sped up the rate at which that presented itself. I had the shoulder surgery at 13. And that was kind of quite a strange experience that I hadn't. I, I, I didn't really ever feel very connected to what was going on at the time, mm. I don't think, because I was quite dedicated in school. I wanted to be fine. 
hence the name of my podcast. Yeah. And um ah. and and that kind of just entailed, well, it was quite a big operation and I had an allergic reaction in hospital. Oh my gosh. The morphine drip wasn't delivering and then it all kind of came at once and then I had an allergic Ooh. reaction and uh there was an adrenaline shot which was pretty intense. Jeez. But that was kind of I suppose in a way in my in my mind that part of the story almost feels like irrelevant <laughs> because the shoulder injury was an accident uh, that was able to be fixed but what came after was the presentation of ongoing issues so at 15 at 14 i started experiencing pain when i was walking and kind of looked at it in a way of like having a paper cut or something. I didn't take it seriously at all. And in other words, ignored it. I started experiencing this. I didn't even recognize it as pain. I just started kind of Mm. limping. And then after a while, I remember I did this big expedition when I was 15 and I really struggled to walk um, kind of towards the later stages of the day. And and then mm. that, that kind of progressed and it became very difficult for me to walk at all. And I went to go and have MRI scans and a number of scans, basically. And um, again, it seemed to take quite a while to diagnose. And eventually what transpired is that I had hip dysplasia, which is actually quite a normal thing, um, relatively speaking. A lot of the time, babies are diagnosed with hip dysplasia at birth, and then they'll be put in a cast. Say, say what hip dysplasia is for people who might not know. So hip dysplasia is essentially where the coverage um, on your hip socket is deficient. So your hip socket is meant to cover 30%, 25 to 30% of your um, of the ball going into your hip socket. And mine was covering 11%. Oh my. On the right side of my, on my right hip. And so I went to the doctor and, and they said, well, you have hip dysplasia and, um, you know, you can do one of two things. Either you can have a hip replacement, oh but you will have to have your hips replaced routinely because at that time, I would have had to have them replaced every eight years, which would be a lot for a 16 year old. Um, But so he said the best route would be to re break and readjust my pelvis. So they broke my pelvis. Well, firstly, I waited for my growth plates to fuse because I couldn't have the operation before I'd kind of finished the most part of my growing. (laughs) And, um, and so, yeah, they, I then finished my GCSEs and, um, and then had the surgery at 16 where they broke my pelvis in three places and adjusted it and, and put it back together with three six-inch screws. And then following that, I had to do a lot of it. I had to learn to walk again, basically. And um, that involved a great deal of hydrotherapy because you can't put very much weight on on broken bones, of course. But then you need to put some weight on it for it to encourage the bone to grow back. Um, so, sorry, I'm, tell me if I'm rambling. No, no, not at all. Um, but basically, I spent a month on bed rest slash in a wheelchair as a 16 year old Um, yeah and and then it took another two months fully on crutches and a third month kind of coming off crutches and I suppose the thing that was difficult was that that was kind of meant to be the end and I'd always been super sporty and used that as I say used but I kind of it, it was something that was in my bones to be, it offered this real sense of freedom, which was kind of taken away from me. 
when I was um, kind of broken, actually, by, by that operation. And the thing is, I thought that that was the end of it. And then it took a year and a half to fully, for the bone to be fully healed and for me to walk normally, basically. And by that time, my left side had started getting worse. And I didn't know at the time, <laughs> but my, my left side had 12% coverage. So it wasn't much better than the right. But I think it was really difficult actually because I finished my A-levels and I kind of, I up until that point had been very uh, committed academically and always wanted to do well. I'm dyslexic and... I think maybe had a, a, a wish to prove mm -hmm. <laughs> that I was not, not kind of different or something. Um, and then, yeah, I think having the first operation really changed, changed my identity in a way to a degree because I'd been this sporty academic person who suddenly didn't have, I also lost control on how my emotions came out. And that was almost the most difficult thing um, because of course I was on pain me medication and I couldn't move. And anyway, I finished school and I had the second operation. And Which was I, similar to the first one? It was the exact same procedure um, a year and a half later. And so I'd had the shoulder surgery at 13 then the hip started playing up at 14, 15, surgery at 16. I had the screws removed at 17 and then the other major surgery at 18. And by the time, I think the second surgery was the one where, um, where I sort of started to fall into a place of hopelessness, really. Or I became impatient with the process because I suppose you would maybe imagine that the hospital aspect would be the difficult part. And it's, it's the more sort of hairy part, like you're less able. There are aspects of your, well, in a lot of your dignity disappears. You can't go to the loo alone or you can't wash yourself or put on your clothes, et cetera. But it was actually the part afterwards, the lengthy year and a half, which I think um, was difficult. And so anyway, just, just to kind of jump forward, then I got to 20 and, and I had this pain increasing in, my, in both hips. And I had more scans and, and they basically said that there were further structural issues. So the tops of my legs were at the wrong angle and the ball going into the joint was at the wrong angle. And the proposition was to have eight further operations, which would endure the same recovery process for each. And I, at that point, just, oh my God. I think I really, um, I fell into kind of a bit of, I suppose, despair. I felt despair. And I also um, didn't know what to do because there, obviously, I mean, not obviously, you don't know me, but I, I feel lucky in that I am able to have these surgeries and I have sure. a really supportive family. But that also was difficult because it's, it's hard for them to understand what's going on. And, um, I think as I felt myself falling into a kind of darker mental space with where this was going, I withdrew and kind of, I was never, to be honest, I was never great at communicating what was going on internally for me. And that you know, learning to do that has been a huge part of change, basically, for me, um, has been learning, learning to communicate and, and speak 
openly and honestly, basically, um, which I'd always imagined was a kind of burden, but actually it's a way of um, accepting and therefore moving forward. Um, but also all the while, it's funny because my, my modeling career had actually started almost in tandem Yeah, yeah. with all of this that was going on. But I suppose also it's worth mentioning that my, my, cause part of me sort of wonders like, mm, what's the point in telling people about this? Um, because it's something of the past, but it's informed everything today. And I suppose where I was a very lonely and isolated person once going through this by myself in terms of like the nuances of it, I, I would have loved to have heard other people inform me about how they navigated pain and under, getting a better understanding of pain has been so empowering for me. And, and I think also there's another part to it, which is, it is, there are things that are sort of scientific and medical about it, like what shows up on a scan, but it's very difficult to apply that to how you experience the world and how you live each day. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's pain is from my perspective, quite a subjective experience, but also an experience where if you can accept it and kind of look into the shadow to use your term, if you can, if you can actually look into the shadow or go into the shadow, it allows you to familiarize yourself with it rather than run away from this thing that's with you and, and turn it into um, greater depth or greater light or, um, or some, some kind of tool even. I'm appreciating the, the span of years where this ball didn't stop rolling. You yeah. know, you get through the shoulder surgery and good, that's behind you. Uh-oh, um, now there is a hip dysplasia on the right hip. Okay, that's behind you, but not. Then the left hip and, and, and then the tops of your legs and so on. Uh, that there, there wasn't an overall understanding. This just kept unfolding like, you know, the goalposts moving and not able to get to a sense of having it be over. Mm. Uh, and I'm thinking of the uncertainty here and the continual surprises of additional physical pain, structural problems, surgeries. Totally. Uh, yeah, the sense that there will not be an end to this. Yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting point because when you say it back to me like that, mm. the actual mm. facts of what happened is that my physical body was sort of impaired in ways uh, um, continuously throughout my adolescence and having formed my identity and personality as a child, mm -hmm. I suppose it sort of felt really confusing. And mm -hmm. I actually, you know, what's so funny is that when, when, when you say that, I almost feel it's only recent that I actually connect to that as a truth because I don't really see myself mm -hmm. actually as someone who's like gone had these multiple physical situations to deal with because something that's curious about pain actually is that it really brings you into the present mm. um present mm -hmm. good and bad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah. and I think to your point about um, 
about sort of it being never ending and 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 constant actually it was constant um and uncertain the uncertainty is yeah. almost the greatest torture because and torture is a very strong word to use but when i say torture i mean internally it um it sort of sparked so much fear actually growing up for me and fear that today still visits me from time to time in the same way that it visit you anyone you know your tax return comes through or so and so doesn't get back to you <laughs> or what's going to happen to my health you know you don't realize um you don't realize its value or your your physical, um, you don't realize your your sort of dependence on your physical body until you don't have that. And I think also the other thing to say is that as part of fear, almost the opposite, or, or sort of not opposite. I suppose the opposite of fear actually to me would be openness or love. And when in fear, which I've spent a lot of my time in fear, it's made me want to grasp for some kind of certainty or control, which I don't have. And actually, if you are trying to, um, to grasp certainty, you will only be disappointed. Oh, yeah. I'm appreciating, too, that all of this happened, uh, especially so much pain and so much fear, at a time of life uh, when forming an identity and growing a strong, well-adapted, flexible, uh, confident ego is one of the paramount tasks of adolescence and early adulthood. Uh, so this came at a time developmentally where uh, it was especially difficult uh, that you don't have, yeah, and you don't have control. Yeah, it's a really interesting observation, actually, because I think the experience of puberty um, is scary. Mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> because you don't really know what's going on. and. And, um, you know, I obviously can't speak for everyone who goes through puberty, but a lot of people that I know and definitely myself, I felt insecure in my body at that time. But also I was quite late to develop. A lot of my friends kind of developed quicker than I did. And actually I had started my cycle pretty pretty close before all of this started to happen. Oh, gosh. And so what's kind of interesting is that, yeah, that formation of identity, I, I'd always wanted to kind of be good <laughs> or, like, be helpful. You know, in my family, I'm the oldest of four. And um, I wanted to help. Helping was something that was important to me. And, but, but also contrasting to that, I, I hated being helped. And in, in some ways, I had a real lack of humility. Because, yeah, sure. Because the not wanting help, okay, yes, there's independence, but there's also pride. Yeah. yeah. Part of being fine. I'm fine. Yeah. I don't, exactly. I don't need help. I don't need anyone. Leave me alone. And I think also that sort of, that really, I don't think that you are, um, I don't think one presents as proud uh, necessarily as a sort of arrogant person, but, but pride can be, uh, leave it with me. I'm, I'm fine. And, and it's a defense. It's sure, a fear of absolutely. vulnerability because if, yep. if I let anyone into this, 
then they're going to see that I'm drowning. <laughs> I, I want to pick up on that, actually. Um, you mentioned um, being alone, uh, loneliness. I want to I want to stay here for just a minute because uh, going back to your story, you mentioned that you started limping. When, when did you say about fourteen or fifteen? You you were just you, you you didn't even recognize that you were in pain, but you just started limping. And I I found myself wondering, who noticed? Who noticed that you were limping? Were there there were were there adults who said what's going on? So I did notice, but I ignored it. <laughs> okay. But did um, anyone else notice? Yeah. So the thing that sparked, you know, a, a medical investigation or whatever you want to call it was my mom. Because my mom was suddenly, my mom basically said, this is this, what's going on? This isn't normal. Right. The fact, the fact that your, your, your pain is evident. Yeah. You're limping. Yeah. What's happening to you? Right. And mm -hmm. I suppose my, um, my response actually always to that sort of thing up until fairly recently was, um, kind of go away. Mm -hmm. I don't defensiveness because even though it wasn't like I had, it's not a character, um, it's not, it's not a character quality to have physical ailments mm -hmm. or a decision, mm -hmm. but I, it felt per, in a way personal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was quite defensive of being physically okay. And I don't know if that's because I had previously had the, the shoulder operation and didn't mm -hmm. want to not be able to play <laughs> yeah. Uh, or, or if it was that I, I grew up kind of, you know, whether it was on purpose or not, I grew up learning that strength was, and I, I do sort of quotation marks because I think strength has many meanings and mm -hmm. not talking is not necessarily a strength, but the sort of, never complain, never explain, mm -hmm. um, and just getting on with things. I think I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have problems and I didn't want to be a problem either mm -hmm. because maybe that would be weak. So, so to, to keep, keep with the theme here of, of aloneness, because I do think it is a critical part of what our Shadowlands uh, series is really about is that one of the things that you experience when part of your life is in shadow is a profound sense of aloneness often. And so you're, you're talking about kind of wanting to be alone with your pain because you didn't want to recognize it. And then I, I imagine that there's also a way that, and this is just my experience in working with people who've had chronic pain, there's a way where you become kind of locked in because very few people out there, um, well, first of all, no one out there usually knows what you're going through because the pain is a purely subjective internal, you know, it's, it's not like, um, you know, it's not like when you're bleeding and everyone can see that something's wrong. When you're experiencing pain to the outside world in, in a very fundamental way, you might look fine. People are not aware of what your internal experience is. And it's also very difficult to communicate. You know, I'm finding myself, by the way, and I hope we get there. You, you mentioned starting to feel pain when you were 14 or 15. And I thought, I wonder what that felt like. Like, where was the pain? What is your experience of the pain? What is your experience of pain now? Where does it hurt? You know, one of the things that I think happens in, in psychotherapy is that we ask our patients those questions, not, not, oh, you're not feeling well. No, really tell me, what does it feel like? Help me understand what that feels like. But it's very difficult to communicate about pain. And it also, uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily want to talk about it. You, you don't want to, like you said, you don't want to be a burden. You don't want to complain. I mean, some people do. <laughs> 
but a lot of us try not to. So we, 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 the only way we can bring other people into our experience where we can share it with someone else is to try to describe it, but it's, there are many barriers to doing that. So we wind up being very alone with our pain and people around us not even sometimes being aware of it. Hello. I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity to join me and an amazing group of women for brunch on September 22nd at 1230 in Wayne, Pennsylvania. You'll enjoy fabulous food and great company. I'll be there to talk about my book, The Vital Spark, reclaim your outlaw energies and find your feminine fire, and every guest will get a signed copy. In the process of growing up and adapting to external demands, Women often cut themselves off from vivifying qualities such as shrewdness, cunning, and disagreeableness. We think we're not allowed to be such things, but reclaiming and integrating these qualities brings new energy for living. I hope you'll join me on the 22nd if you're in the Philly area. For more information or to register, contact Jill at happywomendinners.com. That's Jill at happywomendinners.com. Thanks. I'm so appreciating you lifting up the emotional part, the psychological part of, of the physical pain ha- has all these feelings that go along with it, the despair, the aloneness, and the having to hide it mm-hmm. uh, to be okay, especially during adolescence where a, a persona is forming uh, we want to be okay, keep up with peers, um, not be dependent, you know, on people to help you walk, to help take you to the loo, as you say. Um, and so there is a lo- that's the part that's really in shadow, it is how you felt. Exactly. Well, you both said so many Mm. interesting things that just spark actually so much. Um, And I really appreciate your insights. I think the first, the first thing that sort of comes to mind actually is um, Debbie, you were talking about kind of character formation and adolescence and you know, at, at that point in my life, I didn't know who I was. I, just, I still don't sure. know who I am, whoever really knows fully who they are. But I definitely had no idea who I was. I had ideas about who I wanted to be. I didn't necessarily have a value system of my own. I had um, ideas about what that should be based on society culture or the people around me, my parents, blah, blah, blah. Um, but because in a way this youth offers so much possibility and opportunity and, and I think part of why I only wanted to show the part of myself that was seemingly okay or happy or, uh, joyful or accommodating or hardworking was because I didn't want to be defined by that. But the the shadow side of that was that I was abandoning and rejecting a massive, massive integral part of, of my formation and my experience. And I think part of that was that, to be honest, I never really was very connected to my mind and body when I was younger, when I was a kid or when I was a teenager, it wasn't something, you know, things happen in your life that teach you your learnt or cool beliefs or whatever about the world. And For whatever reason, I felt that it was unacceptable for me to need or for me to not be okay. And and I think also 
I had this incredible opportunity as a model, which I definitely lent into with with great enthusiasm and excitement and curiosity for this other world and also this persona that I would play every time I went to work because that was my job. And 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 I had success and I had independence with that, which was really such a privilege. And I didn't want to waste that opportunity. But when for me at least, or in my experience, when I uh, disconnected from what was truly going on internally, emotionally, mentally, as well as physically. I mean, I did practical actions to deal with the physical side, but I didn't, I didn't pay attention to it. I lost, I, I lost um, part of myself and that's lonely. You're lonely not only in your own company without realizing that you can't connect, you can't authentically or truly connect to other people, whether it's family, friends, lovers, whoever, because you're consciously or unconsciously hiding something. And that feels like a secret in a way, which, which, then I suppose transpired and developed into shame. Yeah. Mm. Wow. You know, what, what you've said about your experience highlights so vividly the, the, the contrast between persona and shadow. And that here you are, you know, these opposites are so vivid. Uh, in your history of being able to have a career as a model, look wonderful, have that be perceived as something very special and in the success there, and then it forced into the shadow all of those parts of yourself that you've spoken about, of how you really felt, uh, having to hide things of having having a sense of shame that then gets compensated for, I would imagine, you know, by people uh, being so glad that you're there and that you can look so good and so beautiful. And then we get isolated from ourselves as well as from other people. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a beautiful and I'm mm. I'm really sitting into it. Jean, what you said about kind of getting cut off from something so integral and mm -hmm. and something so important because mm -hmm. there was this just part of your experience that you very understandably wanted to distance yourself from. But the, the part of you that was suffering through that uh, was, was, was really in some kind of uh, crucible. In other words, what was happening was really important and you, you were kind of distancing yourself from it. Um, uh, so, so much to, to talk about here, but, but Deb, as you alluded to, I think it's so important to think about, you know, persona and then actually what compensates persona is shadow. And, and that I think is one of the really interesting things about your unique perspective, Jean, is that you've really sort of lived both of those in an extreme way. So if we can go into that part of the story a little bit, could you tell us how your modeling career began? Was it, was it something, had you ever wanted to be a model? Uh, was it something you pursued? This is a world so very far from my personal experience that I, I just maybe have some imaginations about it. But just tell us about that. Um, so... Well, as a, as a child, I'd never... I was always very shy and very, I wanted to be accepted, definitely. That was part of, um, I remember that as, as being important to me when I was little and I moved schools. I was bullied at school, like a lot of people, kids can be me. Um, 
And then what happened is so I went to secondary school. And I was 12 or 13, I can't remember. Maybe I was 13. And I went to this, this thing called the Birmingham Clothes Show Live, which is this huge um, warehouse full of sort of things to see. And it was all about fashion. And I was scouted there. And wow. I was with my friends and I kind of, uh, I, I was quite surprised. Um, so what just, I mean, I've heard that phrase before, but I've never actually known, like, what actually is that experience? Like, <laughs> it's, yeah, so it's, you it's essentially, you know, yeah. a stranger comes up to you and says, um, do you model? Have you ever thought about modeling? Um, and then they, I think they gave me a card or something. Huh. Okay. And I, at the time, remember feeling actually quite embarrassed. Um, I don't really know why, but, and, and I'd never, I'd never, um, I looked at fashion actually when I was younger, I looked at it and it's all about this sort of creating these incredible dreams and it's really the work of imagination and creativity. And I, I really, I loved Alexander McQueen and I loved Tim Walker, who's a photographer. And I loved, you know, Stella Tennant was a model who, um, who really sadly passed away, but she, she was a really close family friend and I really looked up to her. And so I suppose my only association was the things that I saw, um, in magazines and also her as this cool person who I love. Um, but so, so you get, you get this, you know, person walks up to you and hands you, by the way, this sounds a little bit to me like getting your letter from Hogwarts when you're 11, just yeah. like sort of out of the blue. <laughs> it's like, come be a part of this, this world. Yeah. But, but you, you get this and it's a little embarrassing. And, and what, what do you well, do? Well, I suppose it? I didn't know what to think. And then what happened is it happened it's, it started to happen more. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> kind of wandering around. This never happened to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, but there's started, something about being chosen. Yes. Yeah. Well, that felt, that, that felt, that felt special and it felt yeah. like an opportunity. And I think also I, once I had kind of evaluated that it was, actually a possibility yeah I then I then wanted to do it and I wanted yeah. to do it because I wanted to um I wanted to be independent and I wanted to also um I wanted to learn about this world and I wanted to see I wanted to kind of explore I guess sure. and I wanted to have a job I wanted to be a grown-up yeah um and then what happened is I, my parents, it's obviously, well, not obvious, I don't know. They, they said that I couldn't do it, basically, because I was too young. Mm -hmm. And then we, and I was quite headstrong because I really um, was so eager, actually, to get into life for whatever. Mm. So I think a lot of kids want to be grown-ups and then grown-ups want to be kids or whatever. <laughs> but, but, um, but then we basically agreed that if, if there was an opportunity still available to me when I finished my GCSEs, then I could do it. And, and because there had been quite a few, there had been a bit of interest up until then, I had the remarkable opportunity of having my first ever shoot was with British Vogue, wow. um, which was incredible. And it was actually just before my hip surgery. The first hip surgery. Yeah. When you were 16. And, yeah. And I remember being really so taken by this world and so taken by I worked with a photographer called Bruce Weber, who was 
very well established and and he had kind of curated everything from the playlist to the narrative to every every single detail was curated for you to live this character out for the purpose of the shoot and embody an energy and a and a something that he was wanting to capture. And I loved that. I also felt like a complete imposter and like I didn't deserve to be there because in many ways, like who deserves that opportunity? But at the same time, I think because I felt so lucky and, um, like you said, almost like I'd been picked and what are the odds of that? I, I wanted to, to make sure that I did a good job. And, um, and what's funny is you, you kind of go from being, or I went from being a 16 year old doing my exams, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, swatting mm-hmm. away, trying to get my grades to then going into this very adult world as soon as you come onto a set, it's an adult world and the fashion industry is a very adult world. And, and I'm sure that part of why, I think it's an interesting one, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Was I already someone who, who didn't want to, you know, reveal my shadow? Probably yes. Did I do something that encouraged me to hide my shadow? Yes. Yes. But it, it compensated, you know, uh, that on the one hand of uh, all of the difficulty and physical and emotional pain were compensated for by the affirmation, uh, the being chosen uh, for modeling. So I don't think, I almost think it wasn't, it didn't. I suppose affirmation in a funny way doesn't feel quite, it doesn't feel maybe so true to what it felt like. It was a compensation a hundred percent. I think I was, it felt like this compensation of complete luck and, and having an opportunity that was not fair, you know? So, so I want to lean into this just a little bit more. So here you are, you're 16, 17, you're living with pretty much constant pain at this point. So at, at, so I had, I had the first, I did the first shoot and then I was uh, bed bound like two weeks later for a month. Because of the surgery or because you were in so much pain? Because of the surgery. But, But even like at the shoot, are you in pain? You know what? It's a really interesting question because I never think about that shoot and think of the pain. I think of all the things that I've described. Yes. But I would have been in pain. Yeah, I would have been in a crippling man of pain. There's this juxtaposition, this remarkable juxtaposition going on of your body betraying you. And, and you know, you're supposed to be a young woman who's, who's growing and thriving and your, your, your body is betraying you and, and, and you're in constant physical pain. And at that same time, your body. Yes, exactly. Vaulted you into this. It's offering me everything. Yeah. It's offering me a world beyond my wildest dreams. Yep. And you know, what's also interesting, I think is It's funny to me that I can't remember what the pain was like at Mm -hmm. that time Mm -hmm. because I think it provided an escape. And I also imagine maybe, or I wonder if part of why, why maybe I ignored it or tried my best to ignore it was that when I did, it felt like it didn't exist and I was just only existing in this other world, mm-hmm. which of mm-hmm. course wasn't true. And when mm-hmm. you ignore the pain, it comes back to bite you. Right. Which, which I want to get to, cause you've, you've alluded to that, that, that we haven't talked about it yet, but I think it's really important is sort of like, what's the attitude shift. But I, 
I just, I just want to, you know, there, there is a real connection with shadow and the body, especially I think in, you know, Western culture, you know, that, that, that often, you know, the, the shadow pretty much is uh, the container for shadow for, for many of us. And, and here you're having this very interesting relationship with it um, in that both, yes, the, the, the shadow is really coming up through this embodied experience. And at the same time, it's also kind of, carrying this very light, bright, um, persona. So, so, um, so, so let me, let me go back and pick up something from the story and and see what comes up from there. So you were, you were told, uh, you had the two hip surgeries and then there was this other pain and you were told, uh, there's more structural issues. And did you say eight more operations? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. And that's when you slipped really into despair. So you couldn't, the protective wall that you put up failed at that point that there, that, that you, you slipped very understandably into, uh, into a dark place. And I'm, I'm curious about what that was like in your life in general and did it affect your work and that kind of thing. But then did you elect to have those eight surgeries? No. Let's just sort of do the, the, what, <laughs> what, what did you do? I didn't, I didn't, have the surgeries I didn't see it as an option because it would have taken six years of wheelchair to crutches to operations to wheelchairs to crutches and I, at that point I already had felt quite heavily impacted by what mm-hmm. what you know the the four hip surgeries I'd already had and so I didn't have it I didn't have them and I didn't have them because I just, he sort of said, the the doctor sort of said, you know, you can choose to have these when you like. It's, um, you know, your your situation is progressive. Um, You may not have to have them or, but but in order to be pain-free and structurally sound, you will. And I just, Mm. I just, I felt really angry, actually. I just felt like, what, what the fuck, basically. <laughs> basically yes. Like, use my language. But, but you know, you're, you're joking. Like, I've had these, these five huge operations up until now, and I'm, I'm either stuck in this pain or I have to have these eight surgeries and it and it felt like which is the work, which is the better of two evils, basically. Mm-hmm. And I fell into um, a state of hopelessness where I didn't, I couldn't imagine things mm. changing. That's what happened. I couldn't imagine beyond. And I know that you know we're encouraged to live in the present, but I think a Oh, you have to have a sense of, of the future. Of what can motivate sure. you is, is especially when you're young and terrified, is is thinking about the promise of the future. And I didn't, I couldn't imagine things changing. And and I felt, I felt, um, I felt sort of, I felt lesser to be honest. I felt mm. like you know, my friends are. Firstly, my relationship with my my body completely yep. changed at that moment. Can, just, really, just let me. I want to just nail this down. You're twenty twenty um, at this I'm point. About twenty, yeah. Okay, all right. So, so, so uh, t- say say now how your relationship with your body changed. So my relationship with my body completely changed. Mm-hmm. Where once upon a time, it had been this vehicle for freedom i loved running Mm. i loved god i loved sports i loved exploring um with my legs (laughs) and and i loved my job as well Mm. but it suddenly it suddenly just felt like who you think you are is not actually who you are now and um I unplugged and I dissociated and, and I basically, um, 
I felt very uncertain. I didn't have the answers and nor did anyone else. The, the, I guess the surgeon had the surgical answers, but the physio had the physio answers. There wasn't a clear cut path for me. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt, um, I felt ill-equipped to deal with, deal with it and to know how to navigate it. And as a result, I kind of had this sense of like, okay, well, maybe I just can't do anything. Hmm. And I think that the other thing that's sort of, that's relevant to mention is that it began to affect, I suppose you could also say it developed from chronic pain into complex chronic pain. And complex chronic pain, I've since learned, is where consistent pain from a physical, structural situation Mm. uh, begins to affect your mental condition and your mental state. Sure. And it began to um, cast this shadowy filter over every single situation I was in, whether I was at work. And I would be trying to ignore it, but it was clawing at me. Or if like I was the, like the pain was clawing. Yeah, at it was very. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was in my face, pounding. And jeez. Mm, or you know, I would be speaking to people, or I would be in a conversation, and I would be half there and half thinking about. It's not even think I wouldn't be, I, w- I would be aware of the pain, but mm-hmm. then that what would happen with the awareness of the pain is that it would branch out into fear, anxiety, um, shame, anger, anger, um, all of, all of these things, which I then the the sort of, it, it almost developed into this internal battle where I had this persona that I believed I was it wasn't Mm -hmm. like oh I'm gonna put on my mask even though now I think about it I probably had a very well developed mask um but I had this persona and then I had this this shadow that was growing and it was bigger than me and, Mm. and it was scary and it felt it felt out of control to be honest because because I started to not trust, I started to sort of lose faith in myself and my ability to be in the world um, in the way that I wanted to be, or I'd been able to be at that point. Mm. Because, because I was contending with this, with this thing that I had no language for. Mm-hmm. And, and, and also in a wider, in a wider sort of, uh, culture. I had no, I had no one to sort of look to. Not that I'm the only person, of course. Sure. We all know that everyone deals with these issues. Uh, I can, I am uh, lifting up a few things from what you said. Uh, one of which is the lack of language, the lack of words to say it. Um, another is um, how important it was for you, especially in that first uh, shoot uh, with a photographer who created a story of how important the realm of being able to imagine is. That's such a great point. We imagine ourselves, and you lost that because of the fear and the despair and the hopelessness. And so I'm thinking this may lead into how did it change? How did the pain and your relationship to it uh, begin to move into who you are now? Right. You you didn't get those surgeries. So what did happen? Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> um, Language, so- pain, and and transformation. <laughs> yeah. I suppose one of the, there are a number of things. Um, 
you know, nothing is 2D, obviously. <laughs> um, one thing was that I had these, I had physio. Um, I was I was doing physio to strengthen my body. Um, and I sort of began exploring different ways of doing that physio without it being under the banner of you're doing physio right now. So I started to look into ways of strengthening my body. Um, and so for instance, Pilates, or I would do the, these physio exercises that I would, I would also find YouTube videos, which would include, um, parts of my physio. So then it became, it transformed from being this burdensome thing of, oh, I have to do this physio now and I can't move, I can't run, I can't whatever, because I still can't run. <laughs> um, but it, it transformed into this um, challenge for me to try and become strong. Because what happened is I started doing these doing these exercises and exploring different forms of low intensity exercise that I could do I became curious and and I started to witness a change in my physical state not only did my my struck my 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 sort of muscular structure became stronger and therefore I felt able, more able, which, which switched something in my mind. It made me feel um, like I was improving or like something was changing and I was getting stronger. And the other thing that I did was, you know, I, I, I met this, this meditation coach and I didn't care at all about meditation to be completely honest prior to this point because I didn't think that it was something it didn't compute to my pragmatic rational approach to how I could you know uh resource myself but having come at it from quite a sort of nihilistic perspective what happened is I started to practice meditation and it freed me from my physical state and connected me to something outside myself whilst also reconnecting me in a sort of primal way is how I would describe it to my body. Um, mm -hmm. Because what it did is it, it started to give me a second of, the, of peace of mind. And, and I didn't have peace of mind before, but it was the combination of these two, these two things. And, and the other part, the, I, I also have been, I have had um, help, you know, I've done therapy and uh, work around this and which is obviously not something everyone can do um but through therapy um I suppose there was a process of admittance to my fallible uh internal world that was sort of crumbling um in sort of depression and just a really bad place mentally and emotionally. And through that self-knowledge, you, you, you have the chance to get to know yourself. And that is positive. And also it's kind of unpleasantly surprising sometimes. I'm appreciating uh, your expanding uh, in ways that are related to ego strength and development by reframing um, the, the duty and the obligation to do physical therapy into a challenge. 
that that has mastery and it has uh, growth and change. And yes, I can. And at the same time, expanding into something beyond ego, something uh, sustaining that undergirds all of us uh, through meditation and therapy, uh, of bringing uh, a different perspective into this, an imaginal perspective uh, from an ego point of view and from the point of view of psyche and the unconscious. And that 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 started to shift things. You had a bigger context and a bigger self to bring to all this. Yeah. And, you know, a big part of that was becoming willing to accept help and admit, mm. admitting, <laughs> admitting yeah. defeat. And through becoming willing to accept help, I... Uh, was able to learn and I was able to see that I didn't actually know. I didn't know um, what I thought I knew and I didn't, I didn't actually have the tools to manage what I was navigating. And through, through going from a place of um, I'm a type A personality and and you know i don't i don't struggle with things like pain and i don't struggle with mental um mental challenge and mental health going from that position of i i'm i'm fine and i'm doing i'm doing good thanks nothing to see here to actually um i do need help and and i became open so, so Jung, Jung referred to that as the relativization of the ego, of kind of putting your ego in right relationship with the rest of you. And I, you know, Jung also said something that's so interesting is that, um, paraphrasing here, but you're, you're unlucky if you're too successful in life, because then you never learn about the, your dependence on the unconscious. And that is what the pain dipped you right into, is that you, you couldn't just rest into a kind of ego functioning and persona, that it was a real demand that you make contact with the rest of you. Mm. You know, have you ever read the book by Ursula Le Guin called A Wizard of Earthsea? No. Shall I write that down? Um, it's such a beautiful book. It's, it's, it's high fantasy is the genre, but it's, it's really beautiful. And I, uh, it's very Jungian. It's very, very Jungian. Um, but, but it, yeah, I keep on thinking about it with your story. So it, it, it follows the adventures of a young wizard named Ged. And early on in his career, he has such kind of arrogance and hubris that he engages in this ritual. I think it's been a while since I read it, that he's not supposed to. And he conjures up the shadow. I think it's just called the shadow. But the shadow haunts him. He has to, he spends, once the shadow is conjured, Ged spends pretty much the rest of the book running from it, trying to keep it at bay, running, 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 traveling, going here, going there, trying to keep it at bay. And it's always on his heels. And the answer is that has, he has to turn and, and, and befriend it, essentially, sort of show it uh, a friendly face, and then it transforms, which, of course, we, we know that this is how it is. So, so this shadow that got conjured for you, perhaps when you had that ski accident when you were 12, was this tremendous um, grinding, eviscerating pain that was was going to uh, need you in its strong hands in this in this really excruciating way, and and you could have kept running from it with eight more operations, but it sounds like the transformational thing, the the new attitude was, it's mine. It's mine, and it's going to be here, and let me see if I can. Um, come to terms with it or make my peace with it. And, and your, your story about, you know, the physio about sort of like, well, okay, body, 
let's see what we can do here. And, and then the meditation of what happens if I, instead of trying so hard to keep this at bay, what happens if I'm just with it, even just for a second? And it sounds like that's you know, sort of, sort of like uh, the Wizard of Earth. See, that was the thing that I love that made it shift. Yeah, I think really, would I take, would I take having my life without these things mm -hmm. under the bracket of pain? And I don't know that I would. You know, I wouldn't necessarily want to do it again, <laughs> but. But I feel, I feel actually so grateful for, for the things that I have got to learn from it. The challenges that, that have acted as sort of um, brick walls or concrete walls in my way have then transformed into challenges to rise to has been hugely empowering actually. And I think the admittance of actually, it is okay that I don't know how to do this. And it's okay that actually I, I am sort of not fine right now. <laughs> and I, I, I need a, a few trusted people who are gonna tolerate me and, and be patient, who I can feel safe to be that way with. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's the paradox, isn't it? And that uh, being able to accept and befriend the parts of us that are not fine, that are vulnerable and that hurt, and, and find support enables us to be fine in the sense of being at home with ourselves and being and simply being who we are and doing what we can yeah i think i think also you know if someone was listening to this who mm -hmm. was in um a sort of unmanageable pain or they're sort of having this tumultuous relationship with it mm -hmm. The thing that I would, that I'd like them to know is that it's a huge opportunity. It, it doesn't feel like an opportunity, but, but it is. And, and if you're able to feel, if you're able to go into the shadow and, and get to know it and be curious about it and, um, Mm. you know allow allow others into it you can transform that into other things that go far beyond um far beyond the pain being manageable you know my my appreciation the the thing that's one of the greatest gifts is is i do feel a real sense of appreciation for for my body's ability to heal and my you know being okay basically yes exactly being okay is good enough you know? yeah yeah uh so um this has spurred you also to create your own podcast uh, that that does give support, information, and validation to all all kinds of pain, and the hope of a kind of healing that results in a sort of a wholeness, not perfection, but wholeness. But um, would you like to say something about your podcast? How did you get the idea and? I would what is it for you? Okay, go for it. <laughs> well, the podcast has been an amazing, humbling, and such an inspiring mm -hmm. experience to to do. And my 
my sort of, I guess my inspiration for starting it was feeling this, this piece that I have with it and, and chronic pain is still part of my life, but it's not my entire life. And, and I want, I don't want people to be alone with it. And I don't want, um, I wouldn't want someone else going through the experience to feel like they're weird or they're wrong for not being able to deal with it. But, but also for them to have access to, to information, whether that's through the things that worked for other people with these more nuanced subjects or whether it's some of the experts that I've spoken to. I mean, I personally have learned so much from it. Um, and I'm, it's only my experience that I really have to go on. I can't say, I can't sort of talk for everyone, but a theme that's in every single episode is loneliness. And I suppose with I'm fine, it's about breaking that isolation and connecting people to a sense of hope where they can imagine that things may be different. And, and I think also a big thing is, is, is being open to the idea that it's not about finding normality, going back to how things were, but it's about changing how they are now into something else some something else that's right. that's different that you couldn't imagine you couldn't have imagined before. yeah because i think when you are are aiming for for normality or perfection like you mentioned it's it's impossible basically mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so so you know of course the word the word that we're we're really talking about here is acceptance and that once once you sort of accept where you are, then then you can start to change things. But as long as you're clinging clinging to uh, an old ideal, or perhaps just your uh, your your hope for what you wish could be, that keeps you away from acceptance, and that 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 keeps you from being able to transform things. You you know you you said a minute ago um, that that you uh, wouldn't wouldn't necessarily want your life without this you wouldn't want to do it again but you wouldn't want it to want it taken away either and i just want to lift that up because i, I think it's a beautiful uh, example of what we call amor fati which is a love of one's fate mm-hmm. that's so lovely this was your fate somehow and you 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 love your fate even though it's been a difficult one yeah i think well i think you'd learn you learn to embrace it. And, mm-hmm. and what was I literally completely forgot what I was about to say. <laughs> you really hit spark something in me. But yeah, you, you learn to embrace it. And through doing so, it transforms. And, and something that's always been helpful for me is, and this is not something that I always did, but something that's helpful for me in recent history and also today is to ask what is the meaning of this? Because when you ask that, you can try and find some meaning. And it's also not to say that my experience is so, so bad. You know, there's so much worse stuff that happens to people. And I think also part of why I I didn't ever communicate that or accept it was because I didn't feel like it was okay because there's so much worse stuff that can happen. Sure, sure. Um, but this is your suffering. Yes, exactly. And and you know I love you, uh, earlier you mentioned something about a relationship to the pain, a relationship to suffering, and I think that's exactly the right way to think about it. That no matter what our suffering is, no matter what our fate is, we all have. We all have suffering. Yes, some people have it worse, but we all suffer. And what is our relationship with our suffering? And can we turn toward it and, and kind of say, what are you here to teach me? 
Mm. Because it's there anyway. There it is. So what do we do with it? It's there anyway. And I'm just I'm just thinking about the surgeon that said, well, in eight in eight more surgeries, we can fix you the way that many times our culture says not, well, it's here anyway. And so how are you going to live with it? But we can fix it. And some I mean, obviously, some things can be fixed. And if they can be fixed, we should fix them. But I think as a culture, we have a tendency always to think I'm going to fix it. But as long as we're focusing on fixing it, then we're not accepting it. And there there does come a time when acceptance is the medicine. Yeah, totally. Totally. You said something just before then, but I got distracted by your medicine of accepting it. Yeah. Uh, talking about the relationship with the suffering and how that's the oh, thing yeah. that matters. Yeah. I think, I think that thing of, of wanting to, yeah, strive for a perfection or fixed, um, this idea of being fixed mm-hmm. can act as shackles mm-hmm. in itself because you're never going to be okay with the up and the ups and downs that are inevitable and i i think also i would often sort of try to get myself into a condition where it's like okay now now i'm good but then of course the next day is going to be different and the other thing i think that's worth mentioning is i always thought that looking into your own struggle was hugely self-centered and egotistical mm-hmm. and 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 actually what i realized having done that is that you you yeah you learn how to talk about your own stuff or or your own life or you have an understanding of yourself a little bit but prior to that i didn't I wasn't able to really show up. I always wanted to show up and I wanted to be there for others, but I would never really be there fully present Mm -hmm. because I was trying to contend with this or I was trying to carry this secret load or this Mm -hmm. hidden load. And in being able to give the space to, to allow my shadow in, has meant that in my life, I'm able to be there for my siblings. I'm able mm. to be, be there for others. And it doesn't have to be this droning noise that I'm trying to quiet in all the time. Yeah. And that's the value of turning toward shadow and uh, befriending it, allowing it to speak. Uh, is that it makes us more alive, more able to be present, more whole. It's freeing. It takes energy to keep shadow in the background. We have to keep pushing it down, uh, checking the door, make sure it's locked. Yeah. How is, how is um, pain kind of viewed in Jung's philosophy? Is it okay if I ask a question? Mm-hmm, sure. Well, I mean, I, I don't know that he spoke much about pain, but he did talk a lot about suffering. And of course, you know, suffering can be physical, it can be psychological, but suffering tends to be the crucible that transforms us if we can have a right relationship with it. And and I think suffering, I don't know that Jung says this per se anywhere, but I think it's very much, um, you know, I think he would agree with it, is that Suffering is an initiation, and it certainly, certainly has been for you. It's an initiation into our own depths. It's an initiation into an awareness that we are more than just uh, ego. I mean, you know, the, the, maybe, maybe the kind of um, the most fulsome exploration of the subject in Jung's work is, uh, is Answer to Job. 
And of course, Job is is a story, kind of the quintessential myth of our culture about suffering and and what to do with suffering and how we make sense of it, you know, that it's that it's visited upon us without rationale. It's not fair. And it has to do with what you mentioned before, Lisa, of the relativization of the ego, that our our rational, cognitive, uh, ambitious, willing, planning self is not all there is, and it is often just plain not in charge. It's funny, all of those things, you're thinking about one's ego, it's so there and constructed to protect you. But in in my experience with pain was such such a um a blocker to to growth and freedom within living with pain because because of these, all of these ideas that I had about how I should be or what's okay and what's not okay. And, and let me push the envelope there just a little bit, because I think that, again, you have a kind of unique story, because when we talk about shadow, when we talk about persona, we, there is this element about how we are with it, but also how we are in the culture. So for example, some of the other people that we've interviewed for Shadowlands have been living out uh, a, a kind of a cultural shadow. Um, and, and that is actually not your experience at all in, in a sort of visible way, what people project on you and you are in the public eye. So you're mm-hmm. going to get a lot of projections is, um, you know, you're beautiful. You must be happy. Your life must be easy. So I think this goes to what is it like to have to steep in your own shadow Sorry. while getting all of these projections what does steep mean do you well, mind to, it? yeah like a like a tea bag that that you've just been cooked in this that you're just yeah. all the time being kind of cooked in your own pain you know that it's, yeah. it's pretty constant meanwhile the culture is projecting something very different on you so yeah. what what is that like that's a very interesting question It's, I think it's, it's, it's very challenging to be honest, Mm -hmm. because I think having the privilege of the work that I do and live, you know, having the life that I have and modeling and, and the things that are unfair. Um. I suppose I I feel that to sort of earn that, I ought not to make it about me in some way. And Mm -hmm. and it isn't about me. My my, I mean my pain is obviously my experience, but my job as a model has allowed me to to put the things that I've learned and the people that I've met at the service of others, mm-hmm. which feels very important to me. But I mean, I don't have, I also, I don't have, I wouldn't describe myself as famous. I am definitely known, known in, in my industry, I would sure. say. Yeah. But And and in in light of that, I have wanted to to show my gratitude mm-hmm. or to show my appreciation. And I suppose, obviously, I, you know, I have a podcast that talks about pain, so it's not like a secret anymore. <laughs> and it's okay. I guess it's okay. I've I've had to sort of. I mean, hope that it's okay to be both appreciative and grateful Mm -hmm. and also open because there are, 
expectations or stigmas around what certain people do and mm-hmm. how they should be. And, and I think it's quite easy, actually, if you do have a public facing job, and especially in, in my case, it's like very much about just image. Like I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, like a politician or something. <laughs> Well, I, would, I would argue that politicians are a lot about image. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, yes, I agree. But that was a bad example. No, but, I know what you're saying. No. But known, known for image, where the image is, is this sort of created by really brilliant creatives. Mm-hmm. It's kind of um, an interesting one to establish where you're, where your um, your truth fits in within that, because it isn't, it hasn't felt particularly sexy or cool or beautiful at times to to admit um, my own vulnerability. Mm-hmm. But I understand from other people that inspire me that vulnerability is just as valuable, if not more, than any any of those things that are, are you know, that they're, they're on the surface at the end of the day. And and you don't you don't see everything from an image. You you don't see beneath the surface. Right. And there is yeah. so much more beneath the surface. And yeah, so I think it's really important to to know. It's been important for me to know where it's okay or mm-hmm. to to be myself, basically, um, in full form. And 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 when I say where it's okay, that's based on like how I feel. Is it is it okay to present my uh, vulnerability? Yes. So you're with the podcast, your life experience, sharing yourself with us today. Uh, I'm touched by the work of bringing shadow out of the shadows. And, and that we feel, listeners will feel such uh, empathy for that part of you that has struggled and uh, has accepted the challenge. and had to go through all these difficulties as have the people you have interviewed on your podcast. I'm fine. That it, it legitimizes the shadow that we all have. Yeah. And uh, what we can do with it, with ourselves uh, to become more whole. It's not such a fearsome thing after all. Uh, we can turn toward it in some measure. Teen, bef- before we let you go, I'm I'm wondering mm-hmm. something, and I'm I'm thinking some of our listeners might be wondering the same thing. What is your pain like now in your life? Mm-hmm. That's such a good question. Today, whilst doing this podcast, I mm-hmm. actually haven't. I haven't felt. I haven't really felt the pain. Okay. The way that it is today is that there are good moments and there are bad moments. Mm -hmm. There are, and and a lot of that kind of depends on what I'm doing for it. Mm. If I'm serving it in some kind of way, if I'm stronger, it's better. If I'm, if my nervous system is calm, it's better. If I'm underslept, it's worse. If I'm, if I'm on a long journey or I'm sitting a lot, it's worse. Um, but it's it's a small part of my life. Actually, it isn't a small part of my life. It's part of my life that that is sort of um, it. It feels much more neutralized. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of a constant companion, but I'm I'm using that word 
pretty intentionally. Yeah, it is. It is a companion, but it isn't something. There are time. There are moments when I can be um, visited by fear around it, but mm-hmm. but for the most part, it's it's just something that I manage, and I appreciate actually the things yeah. that I do to manage it because they do make me more present. They make me stronger. They make me mm-hmm. um, more open. Um, and, and also it's worth saying that, you know, t- telling, telling my story, I still have this feeling of like, oh my God, talking about yourself. Um, but it isn't, this, this isn't, this isn't a story of how painful and how difficult mm-hmm. that must be. It's a story of how much opportunity there can be through um, the shadow. I think we've really heard that today. And we're so grateful that you came on to tell your story. Yes. I'm so grateful to have shared this conversation with you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you too. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisjungianlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.